Just as the Rocky Mountains rise above the Great Plains, so did optimism tower in the hearts of Longmont's first settlers. Though Native Americans roamed the vast grasslands before immigrants came west, these new settlers made an impact on the landscape that can be seen today. Like many towns along the front range of Colorado, Longmont sprouted from the hopes and dreams of its early builders. The people of present-day Longmont have inherited both the prosperity and misfortunes of the colorful people and dramatic events that shaped this Colorado town. From the early colonists who shared a deep sense of community to those young men who sought wealth in the treacherous gold mines, all of them shaped the Longmont we know today. People like George Zweck, whose success and wealth from his gold mines were followed by financial ruin that left him penniless. And William Dickens, a town founder whose scandalous murder was never solved. Townspeople also watched as the Ku Klux Klan came to power and controlled local government. These are some of the stories that fill the history of Longmont and its rise from a small stage stop in the great American desert to the tree-lined streets of today's growing city. A Portrait of Longmont, a collection of stories about the people who built modern-day Longmont, Colorado. We begin on the dusty road to Burlington, a small frontier town at a crossing on the St. Vrain River. It was 1869 when Mary Terrell, a shy young woman from the east, made a courageous move to the unsettled west. She had married Judson Terrell and journeyed with him to his home in Burlington, Colorado Territory. The train ride to Cheyenne was tame compared with the last leg of her trip, an arduous, dusty, frightening stagecoach ride to Burlington. Years later, she wrote about her life on the frontier, and she remembered how the unsavory odors of beer and garlic from the passengers' box dinners, combined with the bouncing and jolting of the stage, overwhelmed her. She pleaded with her husband to stop the stage. Thinking the stage guard was a bandit, Mary fainted in her husband's arms. Well, now we're behind schedule. Recuperating in the fresh air, she caused the stage a begrudged one-hour delay. This shy, quiet young lady from the East was finally delivered to the stage house at Burlington, where she met the impatient landlady who was waiting for the overdue stage. Mary wrote years later about that meeting. The breakfast was spoiled. So also was the landlady's temper. And while my husband was explaining the situation to her in another room, they left me sitting by a stove, thinking of home and mother. Without any warning, the stove door burst open with a bang and a cloud of smoke, gas, and flames poured out into my face. With an awful shriek, I went over backwards, rocker and all. I was coughing and sputtering and ready to weep. It was too much for that good, sensible English woman to stand, and she showed her disgust very plainly. She said I was a very poor specimen for pioneer life and added the wild and woolly west was no place for me if I was as easily frightened as that. The good, sensible English woman Mary Terrell met that morning was Mary Dickens Allen. When the stagecoach was on time, Allen was known as a most hospitable hostess, running her hotel and dining room like a well-oiled machine. Mrs. Allen's husband was Alonzo Allen, builder of the first cabin in the area now known as Longmont, Colorado. What attracted the Allens and the Terrells to this area also attracted the Little Valley's earlier inhabitants, clean water and fine grassland. 
In the late 1700s, Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians traveled through this small part of their large territory, following the migrating herds of buffalo. For these Indians, buffalo were meat for food, horns for tools, fur skins for clothing and bedding, and rawhide for shields and bindings. When the buffalo herds moved on, the Indians dismantled their teepees and followed. Other people began to lay claim to this area, at least on their maps. At different times, the Spanish and the French claimed these mostly uncharted territories. In 1803, the United States of America practically doubled in size with the Louisiana Purchase, which stretched from the Mississippi River to the Continental Divide. Expeditions of surveyors, botanists, and artists were sent out to map, classify, and describe the new lands. Zebulon Pike led an expedition in 1806. He got as far north as the peak that bears his name, some 80 miles south of present-day Longmont. Fourteen years later, the next expedition's leader reported that the plains that stretched from Nebraska to the Rockies were barren and ungenial, fatiguing to the spirit. On his maps, he labeled this the Great American Desert, and he wrote, It is almost wholly unfit for cultivation, and of course, uninhabitable by a people depending on agriculture for their subsistence. Ironically, the man who wrote these harsh words was Stephen Long, for whom Long's Peak and later Longmont were named. As the surveyors began to chart the new territory, others began to harvest its natural resources. In the early 1800s, trappers and traders ventured out to the plains and foothills in search of buffalo, beaver, and bear. Traders built trading forts that were the beginnings of settlement, a bridge between the trappers and civilization. Charles and William Bent owned a very successful trading company with a string of forts from Santa Fe to Wyoming. Their partner, a young Mexican citizen, was Saran St. Vrain. In 1837, these partners built Fort St. Vrain near the confluence of the Platte River and a small stream. The traders in the area began calling the stream St. Vrain's River. The next wave of immigrants was lured by other natural resources. Prospectors and miners were willing to endure the extreme conditions of the mountains and plains. The cold, the damp, the drudgery, and the danger, all for the chance to make their fortune. And some did. In nearby mines known as Twelve Mile Diggins, Left Hand Creek Mine, and Gold Hill. The gold rush in this territory sparked in 1859. But within a few years, thousands of inspired miners lost their faith and headed back down the mountains. The settlement of this valley began in just that way. Alonzo Allen, builder of the area's first cabin, had joined in the rush to find gold here. He found very little gold, but his farming instincts led him to the St. Vrain Valley. He claimed his parcel of land under the Preemption Act of 1841, which gave settlers the right to claim 160 acres for very little money provided they live on the land and improve it. Allen built his cabin on the south bank of the St. Vrain River, near today's main street of Longmont, and it soon became a landmark for travelers in the area. Nearby, Mary Allen's son, William Dickens, built Independence Hall, a commercial building with room upstairs for occasional dances and celebrations. Independence Hall still stands at 3rd and Emory Streets. Other settlers soon came to the area in the early 1860s, and this valley's written history begins with their claims to ditch rights and land titles. They carved out homes, ranches, and farms from the St. Vrain Valley. Farming was successful in this so-called Great American Desert because of irrigation. So important was irrigation water that the territorial government didn't grant ownership of water along with land deeds. Well, the constitution of the State of Colorado says that you don't own the water. You own the right to use it, and then it goes on to another appropriator on downstream. Uh, back in those days when the farmers settled here and they decided they needed uh, water to irrigate with, they laid out a plan for a ditch to take the water to their property from the St. Vrain River so it would all be gravity flow. 
because there was nothing like pumps, electrical pumps in those days, back in the 1860s and 70s. So they would find out how much water they would need to bring up their crops. So they would lay claim to that, and they'd probably write it on a piece of paper and put it in a tin can and put a stake beside the river, and then they'd get on horseback and go show the judge that they needed so much water to irrigate the property. In turn, the judge gave him that. And uh, still to this day, that's called the doctrine of prior appropriation. So with hard work and irrigation water, farmers in the St. Vrain Valley turned the prairie into rich cropland. In 1862, the Overland Stage Line won the mail delivery charter between Denver and Laramie, a route which happened to pass near Alonzo Allen's cabin on the St. Vrain River. Today, that path is U.S. Highway 287. This new mail route guaranteed a stagecoach would pass through the valley each day. The people of the valley, accustomed to riding to Denver for their mail, requested a post office for their settlement. But a post office needed a name. Settlers from Burlington, Iowa, suggested their hometown's name. And so, in 1862, the frontier town of Burlington had a stage line, a post office, and a name. Day-to-day -day life on the frontier wasn't easy. Burlington settler Ellen Coffin described keeping house in the early years for her two grown brothers, Morse and George Coffin. The boy's house was built of logs, one room and a fireplace. Two bedrooms were built on, and we thought we had things extra good. I cooked over the fireplace, baking in a bake kettle, which I did not like very well. It was a whole day's job to bake a pan full of cookies, as only four could be baked at a time. The lid had to be lifted, and the hot coals removed often. The fronts of my dresses would be scorched, the toes of my shoes burned, and my face blistered in the process. As Burlington grew, Life became easier for the townspeople, as stores and shops brought more merchandise and services. Mary Terrell's husband, Judson, co-owned Burlington's drugstore. Newspaper advertisements promised drugs, groceries, and fancy goods. Ed Newnham operated a blacksmith shop in town, keeping the horses shod and tools mended. John H. Wells provided legal counsel, while also serving as county attorney. Building a town on the frontier had its natural hazards. Heavy snows and extreme cold in the winter of 1863 killed much of the livestock, and the spring thaw brought terrible floods. Besides constant worries from nature's hazards, Burlington settlers felt threatened by Indians. Though there were few direct conflicts between the settlers and Indians of the St. Vrain Valley, Horrible stories of raids and massacres of homesteaders drifted in from Denver and the Plains. Revenge certainly inflamed some of the Plains tribes to acts of violence. Revenge for broken treaties, the loss of their lands, and the slaughter of the vast buffalo herds they depended so heavily upon. Fanning the hysteria was the transfer of cavalry forces from here in Colorado Territory back east to the Union Army embroiled in the Civil War. Ellen Coffin described how they felt. During the summer of 64, we'd hear more and more of Indian troubles. We knew if there was a general outbreak, we'd be in great danger. We would hear of depredations down the Platte coming nearer and nearer. Finally, volunteers for a hundred days service were called to fight the Indians. Many of our boys on the creek responded. The notorious Sand Creek Massacre occurred in November of that year while men from the St. Vrain Valley were in service. Throughout the territory, terrible stories of the massacre gradually surfaced, telling of the many tragedies, including the death of Arapaho Chief Niwot, who was fatally wounded at Sand Creek. For many years, Niwot had used his fluency in Cheyenne and English to bring about a peaceful coexistence between Indians and settlers. He is remembered in many nearby place names with his Arapaho name Niwot and his translated name, Left Hand. The town of Niwot was considered a good neighbor by the people of Burlington. A rivalry arose, however, with nearby Boulder City. In 1870, John H. Wells, a legislator from Burlington, 
substituted Burlington for Boulder City in a committee proposal to establish a territorial university. Had his trick worked, the University of Colorado might be in Longmont today. His colleagues in the legislature were enraged by his prank and demanded he reinstate Boulder City as the site. The rivalry between today's two cities of Longmont and Boulder may have started that day. My decision to go west was from no sudden impulse, for I had from my youth desired to go into a new country and have a hand in building up, rather than sitting down and enjoying the fruits of somebody's labor. In January of 1871, Seth Terry came from Chicago with a small group of people who would choose the site for their Chicago, Colorado colony. This colony was the visionary plan of a group of Chicago businessmen who wanted to build a town and a new life on the frontier. Seth Terry and his group were interested in the Burlington area and considered locating with the town. But a comment about the flood of 1864 prompted Terry to look up the bluff less than a mile from the riverside. There, he decided, there would be the new Chicago, Colorado colony. This group chose the Colorado Territory because other colony experiments, especially Greeley, seemed to be doing well. Also, the territory had an energetic booster willing to travel to Chicago and promote it. Rocky Mountain News publisher William Byers gave interested Chicagoans a glowing report of the potential for farming and for a clean, healthy life on the Colorado frontier, free from the tuberculosis outbreaks common in America's cities at the time. On such a recommendation, the Chicago, Colorado colony was organized, complete with its own constitution and bylaws. The colony's motto was industry, temperance, morality, and members were expected to live that way. In fact, temperance was enforced by deed restrictions that called for forfeiture of property where spiritus or malt liquors were sold or given away. By joining together to settle on the frontier, these members, with their common values and beliefs, could count on one another to work cooperatively building a town. The colony was so organized, the group mapped out the town well before the first colonists arrived. Street names on the map take us back to those original planners of the colony, prominent Chicago men who never lived here. Journalist and later Illinois Lieutenant Governor William Bross, Methodist minister Robert Collier, Chicago journalist and author Sidney Gay, and Colonel Cyrus Pratt, original organizer of the Colorado Committee. In March of 1871, frontier settlers, or colonists, started their immigration to the frontier. Frame homes and storefronts were quickly constructed with cooperative efforts. By November, Longmont boasted 100 new buildings on this otherwise barren landscape. And bare it was. By some accounts, there wasn't a tree in sight on this bluff. So settlers dug in and planted shade trees at every turn nurturing them with buckets of water from the newly built irrigation ditches. Today's virtual canopy owes its existence to these planting efforts. The wide streets and tall trees of the older parts of Longmont are a permanent reminder of the town's original settlers. The roots of commerce were put down as well. Promotional pamphlets published in November of 1871 touted the town's progress, a drugstore, shoe and boot shop, a bank, livery stable, hardware store, dry goods store, grocery store, and 20 miles of irrigation canals. Some of those stores and homes belong to former Burlington townspeople. Most of Burlington's residents pulled up stakes and moved up the hill to Longmont. But most of the new buildings were colony built. One, of which the citizens were quite proud, was the library. Amazingly, the doors opened just three months after the first settlers arrived, a reflection of the high priority placed on having a town library. The library's architecture reflected the restrained values of the temperance colony through its balance, symmetry, and lack of ornamentation. Elizabeth Thompson, a New York temperance leader, never lived in Longmont, but she donated the building as a library, town meeting hall, and temporary school. She even donated the first 300 books on the shelves to help the frontier temperance colony off to a good start. 
In her honor, the town threw a gala strawberry festival to celebrate the opening of the library. Today's annual strawberry festival recalls that event, giving modern day Longmont a chance to celebrate the town's history and heritage. Though the town was well planned in advance, the inexperience of the colonists showed up in many ways. The original colony membership was limited to 1,000, but fewer than half that number were ever actually sold. With fewer membership sales, less money was available to complete civic projects like the irrigation system. A most distressing problem was the apparent misconduct of a colony officer, Burton S. Barnes, he resigned his office and left town, and many believed some of the colony's funds went with him. The leadership of the colony suffered a terrible blow at this critical time. Seth Terry was the colony's political and emotional leader. While helping dig the colony well, he was struck by the windlass used to lift dirt. He wrote years later, I never suffered such agony. A two inch long wound on my head laid bare to the skull the colony president suffered from the effects of the head injury for a long time. 1871 was a hard year for the young colony. Their president incapacitated, colony funds embezzled, and low membership. By April of 1872, they were apparently in deep financial trouble. The townspeople sent a petition to the Board of Commissioners of Boulder County, requesting permission to incorporate as a town to dissolve the colony. The exact reasons for this request are a mystery. No records, diaries, or newspaper articles preserve the arguments for or against dissolution. Whatever the reasons for it, the request was granted and the colony was no more. The 1870s saw steady growth in Longmont and in the territory. By 1876, Colorado Territory was settled enough to be granted statehood by the United States of America. During this decade, Longmonters built many commercial buildings, homes, and landmarks that survive today. For over 100 years, these buildings have been homes, businesses, and schools for the people of Longmont. Downtown Longmont began to take shape through the construction of hastily built frame structures. In 1879, those wooden buildings would fall prey to every frontier town's worst fear. About one o'clock last night, a fire was discovered in the bakery building. In a few minutes, the hotel was wrapped in flames, and being entirely of wood and dry as tinder, it was all the guests could do to escape. A smoldering pile of rooms now marks the spot which, but yesterday, was the busiest part of Longmont. The Emerson Buckingham Bank was unscathed by the fire, but its owner, Walter Buckingham, must have been shocked by the event. In short order, Buckingham donated a hook and ladder truck, uniforms, and other equipment for a volunteer fire company. The Buckingham Hook and Ladder Company became a well-respected and much appreciated addition to Longmont's civic services. What the fire company needed most of all was a dependable water supply, and in 1882, a bond election was held to provide a city water system. Local plumber, J.A. Buckley, offered a persuasive letter to the editor of the Longmont Ledger. I am afraid if we do not have waterworks or some protection against fire, more than we have at present, that we shall wake up some morning and find that the town has moved on and will be very badly left. And I would say, here, for heaven's sake, give us something to fight fire if it is only a squirt gun. Buckley's letter contributed to the successful passage of the bond. The new fire department and waterworks renewed the confidence of Longmont citizens and inspired a surge of downtown rebuilding, including St. Stephen's Church, a traditional brick structure with impressive stained glass windows built by the Episcopalians as a permanent meeting place. Dickens Opera House, built by Burlington's William Dickens, to serve the same kinds of functions as his old Independence Hall, but on a grander scale. And the Zweck Hotel. Born in Prussia in 1829, young George Zweck was told by a gypsy that he would find his wealth in the ground. Years later, 
Zweck prospected in the Gold Hill area, filing on several claims. His Prussia mine on Left Hand Creek yielded $400,000 in one month, a fortune in those times. Zweck invested the money in several farms near Longmont, an extensive cattle business, and his dream, a hotel in downtown Longmont. Legend says he didn't have an architectural plan for builders to work from. He translated it straight from his imagination. But George Zweck's luck ran out when the Prussia mine gave out, a blizzard killed most of his cattle, and the hotel failed to make a profit. Creditors took most of his real estate. Zweck's enterprising and determined wife, Mary Louise, held on to the homestead farm by gardening and dairying. Another interesting building was begun in the 1880s. Townspeople hoped the Presbyterian College would fulfill their dreams of having a university of their own. With financial help of local citizens, the college opened for classes, but only in the South Wing, which was all the new college could afford to build. The college survived for several years, offering Latin, Greek, science of the mind, and Old Testament history. Financial difficulties forced its closure. The never completed building went on to serve public and parochial school students until it was converted to apartments in the 1940s. The 1880s were shaping up to be a progressive decade in Longmont. New brick buildings downtown, a waterworks, even a college. Toward the end of the decade, two men moved to Longmont who would add color and spice to the town's history. John Howard Empson was persuaded by his young daughter, Lida, to move to Colorado to improve his poor health. The irrigated fields and orchards in the St. Vrain Valley inspired him to build a cannery to distribute the abundant harvests. In 1889, he opened the J. Empson and Daughter Cannery on 3rd Avenue. In just a few years, this canning operation was reputed to have the largest pea pack in the world. Empson's canning factory, now an apartment building, employed a hundred local workers at a time, though most were paid only 10 cents an hour. T. M. Callahan was another successful entrepreneur of early Longmont. In 1889, he and his wife Alice opened a small notions store on Main Street called The Golden Rule. Callahan developed a system of training sales clerks as managers, then opening a new store elsewhere in partnership with the newly trained manager. He soon owned a chain of golden rule stores in several states. One of his protégés was a young man whose meat market on Longmont's Main Street had failed. His ambitious, hard-working nature attracted Callahan's attention, and he was soon set up in a store partnership in Wyoming. Callahan eventually sold several stores to the young James Cash Penny, stores that became the foundation of the J.C. Penny Mercantile Empire. The Callahans later sold their remaining stores and moved to Reno, but they donated their lovely home and gardens at Terry and Third to the women of Longmont. It is still used as a meeting place for clubs and special occasions. The Victorian home is a showcase of ornate wood carving and beveled glass. T.M. Callahan enjoyed gadgets. In the carriage house, he installed a large turntable for the family cars to avoid backing out of the narrow driveway. And he purchased a very informative doorbell that indicated at which doorway guests were ringing. The electric doorbell and electric lights of the Callahan house were powered by the Longmont Power and Light Plant, which had begun service in 1889. At first, electricity in the town was only available until about 10 at night, when the power plant operator went home. Gradually, service hours expanded and improved. In 1912, the whole operation was taken over by the city and remains today a municipally owned utility. At the turn of the century, the farmers and townspeople of Longmont joined in for a great get-together, Pumpkin Pie Day. Housewives of the area baked hundreds of pumpkin pies in their kitchens all over town. Then, in Thompson Park, slices of pie were served up free of charge along with gallons of hot coffee. It seemed to me that those were the most attractive and delicious pumpkin pies that were made available to the public at that particular time. But that was a great celebration because people came from all over northern Colorado and, uh, and families would gather during the pumpkin pie days and uh, sort of homecomings in those days.
The event was dreamed up as a minor attraction to increase attendance at horse races in nearby Roosevelt Park. But Pumpkin Pie Day became days as the event grew over the years. Extra train cars were put on to carry the crowds here, and the state governor was frequently an honored guest. Longmont was building its reputation as an energetic, growing community. As the 20th century began to unfold, an event occurred in the Dickens Opera House that would change Longmont's course. The meeting was called to secure the contract for a new sugar factory. 1,100 more acres of land needed to be pledged to assure the financial backers of a ready supply of beets in the fall. The crop was new to the area, and farmers were aware it took much hard labor to grow sugar beets successfully. Some felt the contract was risky, promising a crop they'd not grown before. John Darby's father tried his hand at sugar beets at one time. It involved a lot of labor and risk at uh, the sugar beets. And uh, farmer take whatever he does, he, he uh, has a lot of risks. Hail storms, insects, drought. And he has a lot of money invested, which he can lose mighty easily. And on January 2nd, 1903, the pledges came through. The sugar factory would be built. The Longmont Beet Sugar Company started slicing sugar beets on December 18th, 1903. In 1905, the factory was purchased by the Great Western Sugar Company. Throughout its 70 years of operation, the sugar factory modernized and expanded. In the St. Vrain Valley, this single company made a substantial impact on the economy. To make sugar, the company bought beets grown locally, and the factory employed mechanics and laborers, office workers and salesmen. Lorena Darby's father did work for the factory. And in 1903, when, uh, when the sugar factory was built, he was a, uh, a millwright in the finishing of the office building for the sugar factory. And uh, then he went on to build homes for some of the sugar factory officials that came in with the sugar factory. This successful agribusiness got its start in the St. Vrain Valley from those early farmers and investors who were willing to risk a bit for the future. In the early years of Longmont, most of the people living here were like the original colonists of 1871 second-generation Americans of Anglo-Saxon heritage. As labor-intensive beet production grew to serve the sugar factory, the factory and the farmers began to recruit immigrants from Japan, Germans from Russia, and Hispanics from New Mexico, and later from Mexico. These workers and their families came to Colorado's agriculture belt to work the farms and make a new life for themselves and their children. I came over here in 1929 and uh, to work beets. We came, uh, there was a guy from the sugar factory that went to New Mexico and he was looking for some people to come and work on the, on the beets. So my daddy signed up for that and uh, there was about 50 people that came on the train with us all the way into Denver. Then the farmers were waiting for the people that they were bringing, bringing from New Mexico they were waiting at the depot in, in Denver. These men and women and their descendants have added their names, customs, and beliefs to the story of the valley. This is where I've been all my life, and I feel like uh, this is my home, my home place. The coming of the sugar factory caused great changes in the town. But it wasn't the only big news for the people of Longmont in 1903. Those deed restrictions about alcohol were no longer in effect, but Longmont was, by choice, a dry town. 
lively criticism in the local paper and costly saloon licenses had kept a lid on sales of liquor in the town. But saloons would open, several of them in fact, right across the street in a town named North Longmont. It was incorporated by some enterprising folks just north of 9th Avenue. The new town was small, only two blocks wide. But North Longmont had saloons and a jail for all the trouble that saloons brought. Early jail records indicate how folks most often got into trouble. For 10 years, North Longmont served up liquor and then jailed and fined the rowdies. Apparently though, $5 fines weren't enough to give North Longmont a fiscal base. So in 1913, the town was annexed to dry Longmont. Occasionally, there was more serious crime than public drunkenness. In 1915, an assassin's bullet shattered the peace of the town, and an esteemed founder lay dead. In the evening of November 30th, William Dickens relaxed at home, reading in his library room, his wife Ida nearby. A shot was fired from a high-powered rifle in the alley. It shattered the second-story window, killing Dickens instantly. Friends, relatives, and neighbors were shocked by the murder, Details of the investigation and eulogies for Dickens appeared daily in print. There were several suspects in the murder, including some men who worked for Dickens on his sugar beet farms. Dickens' own son, Ramsey, was charged and tried for the crime, but was acquitted after a trial in Greeley. The murder of William Dickens remains a mystery. The fair was a respite from there, ordinary pursuits, daily pursuits of hard work. Hard work for the farmers and their families. Jack Murphy has many fond memories of the early years of the Boulder County Fair. And then it uh, provided them with entertainment insofar as the races were concerned, the horse races. And then it provided an opportunity for them to gauge other farmers with their horses and with their cattle and the lack of that and would probably inspire them to uh, perfect their animals as much as they could. Though primarily agricultural in nature, the Boulder County Fair had attractions for the townspeople as well. We had a big racetrack, and it was a half-mile track, and it was uh, principally uh, harness racing. This up here was recognized as the uh, finest racing event uh, of any place in the state of Colorado. The competition was pretty tough. And there was who got, who went and made the best pie and made the best dress. And the children, the girls would compete for that. It was quite a thing. Underneath the grandstand were these exhibits, exhibit spaces like you see at the National Western Stock Show or someplace like that. And uh, the local merchants would uh, rent those spaces. And there was everything in there from uh, uh, sewing machines to, uh, to the brick and tile factory. And uh, it, they all decorated the booths and they, they, they looked sharp. In 1978, the familiar grandstand and barns at Roosevelt Park were abandoned for the new fairgrounds at Nelson and Hover. The new fairground arena bears the name of its enthusiastic supporter. It's a facility that draws more people to Longmont in a given year than any other facility we have. And all you have to do to verify that statement is to look in the newspaper or listen to the radio and, or the TV and see the events that are listed to be held out there. It's amazing. And people tell me that they just can't, can't believe it. And of course, the annual Boulder County Fair is still a part of this community, blending old traditions with new spirit. Sports also have a long tradition in Longmont, and fans have cheered for local athletes since the town began. The 1908 Longmont High School team, the Beat Diggers, won the world championship in high school football on a muddy Christmas day, beating Chicago's Inglewood High School 13-0. In the 20s, local baseball leagues, known as the Twilight Leagues, were popular for players and fans. John Darby remembers one particular game day. 
weren't allowed to play Sunday baseball. We weren't supposed to play Sunday baseball in Longmont because the city had an ordinance against it. We were supposed to go to church that day. The, uh, I remember we was playing the Hellcats. Armstrong was playing the Hellcats upon the central school grounds one day, and all at once the police came up and stopped us, and those that they could find and round up didn't crawl under cars and, <laughs> and get away, uh, were taken down to the city hall and uh, fined $2 apiece for breaking city law. After that, John and his friends met at Echo Park, outside the city limits. Lorena Jacobson Darby also grew up in Longmont, and she recalled what fun the young neighborhood children had playing together. The kids got together and played, and we did what we called mud crawling in the ditches when there was water in the irrigation ditches. That was when the water wasn't deep enough to swim in. So you went along like this uh, with the mud in the bottom of the, of the ditch. We used to climb up the top of the chicken house and then jump down into the rhubarb patch. And uh, that was always a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes mom would get off a of bed at us, but especially it was early in the season and she hadn't harvested all the rhubarb she wanted. <laughs> we did what we called play out. And the word would go out, and I don't know how, it, sort of by osmosis, I guess, uh, that we were going to have a play out that night. So all the kids in the neighborhood would meet up at this one home of these friends of ours and we'd play run sheep run and hide and seek and kick the can and until it got too dark to see each other or keep from running into the trees and and then mrs hunter would come out with a with a um pitcher of lemonade and some cookies and we'd sit around and talk until it was time to go home and go to bed. We had such fun. Saturdays were special for many Longmont area families. It meant a trip into town. After we'd had our Saturday night bath and got cleaned up and dad had come home and taken his bath and we'd, and we'd had supper then we'd head for town and mom and dad would do their grocery shopping and and then we'd we'd go to a show it was usually a wild west picture which was all right with us these warm childhood memories of early longmont are shared by hundreds of others who grew up in and around the town but some childhood memories are of darker events though only 10 years old in the 1920s Fields Painter vividly recalls when the Ku Klux Klan held power in Longmont. They used to have, as we call them, night shirt parades up Longmont's main street, with everybody on horseback and carrying a torch. But that's one thing about being a kid, you get to know all the horses, whether you know the people or not. But a fat belly will stick out pretty well under a sheet, and if you know the horse, you know who's riding it. The Klan rose in popularity throughout the state of Colorado. In 1923, Denver Mayor Ben Stapleton denied he was a Klan member, but he appointed many Klan members to high offices. Clarence J. Morley was elected governor of the state in 1924 as an outspoken Klan member. Here in Longmont, voters elected several Klansmen to city council. As a majority of the 1925 council, they voted to build Chimney Rock Dam, an ill-advised project from the start. Every loose Klansman that didn't have a job went on the city payroll to build Chimney Rock Dam. You can walk up the canyon above the Longmont Dam now and see the remains of what they poured with, my God, I don't know how much money, but it was a lot, and a lot of Portland cement that they might just as well have dumped in the river. Hand mixing it, 
pouring it with wheelbarrows. It would have taken them 50 or 60 years to get the thing up to hold enough water to supply the town of hygiene. In 1927, the Klan was ousted from the council and Chimney Rock was abandoned. The warehouse of cement purchased to build the dam didn't go to waste, however. Resourceful city fathers used the cement to pave Main Street from 6th to 11th. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Longmont grew, but only a little. The whole state suffered from an economic downturn, especially the mining and agriculture industries. When the stock market crashed in 1929, Longmont's economy worsened, joining the nation in the Great Depression. Over the next decade, one-third of the state's wage earners went unemployed. The miserable economic situation was worsened locally by the dust storms that billowed across the nation's midsection. Cyclical drought and intensive agriculture created a nightmare for farmers. I can remember that people tried to raise crops and there was no rainfall whatsoever. It was almost nil and then the terrible winds blew and it would even cover up fence lines of the topsoil that had blown off the field. It would be four and five foot high and go for miles and miles. And a lot of times almost obliviate the sun. You couldn't even see the sun for the dust. And everybody would say, boys, are real estate moving today. <laughs> it was, but it's all going by wind. Like the rest of the nation, Longmont slowly pulled through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Rains fell on the fields, crops began to grow, and folks went back to work. When the shock of Pearl Harbor hit the nation in 1941, Longmonters reacted just as people in thousands of small towns across America. Local boys and girls marched off to war, women went to work, and rationing became commonplace. A small part of the war came to Longmont when the Great Western Dormitory became housing for Italian and later German prisoners of war who worked the sugar beet fields during their imprisonment. When the war was over, Longmonters welcomed their returning soldiers, mourned their dead, and tried to put their lives back on track. In the 1950s, Longmont's population figure finally hit the 10,000 mark. It had taken 80 years of slow but steady growth to reach that milestone. The next 20 years would see a very different kind of growth, fast-paced and often dramatic. The hallmark event of this change seems to be the arrival of the FAA's Denver Air Route Traffic Control Center in 1962. One of the first evidences that we had that from now on, Longmont would no longer be a primarily um, an agricultural town. See, we had the canning factory, the sugar factory, uh, cattle feeding, all of that. And I think that was the first, about the first indication that, that I noticed that uh, things were a changing in Longmont. The FAA brought in over 200 employees from other locations in the country. These new residents and their families weren't born in Longmont or on nearby farms. They were technicians, trained to operate the broadband radar scopes in order to control air traffic for a five-state region. Gradually, the community absorbed the several hundred new families easily enough, but in 1965, an even bigger change happened when IBM came to the area. The whole county felt the effects of thousands of new residents brought in from other IBM offices. With its reputation for affordable housing, Longmont became home to many IBM employees, and many Longmonters became IBM employees. Over 3,000 area residents were hired at the new plant, giving the local economy a big boost. Many of these new jobs were highly technical, involved in the production of magnetic tape drives and storage devices for sophisticated mainframe computers. The community's identity and its infrastructure changed rapidly as Longmont's population doubled from 1960 to 1970, and doubled again in 1980. When we came over here in 29, you know, the uh, Main Street, the, uh, I know you have seen it on the movies, when they have a, a post in the middle so they can tie the horses in the post. That's what they had over here in, in they had buggies, they had horses. It was just like if you see on TV the Western movies. 
That's the way Longmont was when I came here in Longmont. Now look, it's going that way, it's going that way, that way, and this way. So it's really growing. It's nothing like when I came in, over here in 1929. This rapid development decentralized the town. Many new neighborhoods developed their own separate identities with their own schools and shopping areas. The idyllic small town was turning into a city and its residents faced many crises in the 70s and 80s. One violent incident threatened to tear the community apart along ethnic lines. In 1980, two young Hispanic men were shot and killed on Main Street by a Longmont police officer. The anger and deep mistrust long felt by the Hispanic citizens of the town was finally vented publicly. The tragic event led to confrontations and mediation. The Hispanic community pulled together to form El Comité, and the city made several internal changes. The Office of Community Relations was established, and the police department made major policy changes and created several programs to better work with Longmont's minority communities. Along with the pains of frantic growth, the 70s and 80s also saw some graceful first steps in the change from town to city. Two new high schools opened. A modern civic center became a reality. The downtown area got a much needed facelift. In the 1990s, civic leaders and citizens worked together on a plan for the future, a plan to identify changing trends and community goals. And Vision 2020 looks ahead to the future with a keen interest in Longmont's history and heritage. There are many interesting stories left to tell, stories of early businesses, churches, and schools, of the early railroads and the mills. What all the stories have in common are the people who have left a little of themselves in places, in traditions, and in the land. Longmont's history is still being written today. You can see it happening in our celebrations, our buildings, and our neighborhoods. The story of Longmont isn't over. It's just had an interesting start.